Hey everyone, and welcome back to Calm 70 Media and Society. Uh, I'm all ready today. I got white and shower, but I have my um, red coat on. That's professional. Uh, got some Triscuits. Ready to do this thing. All right. So today, very important, we are going to continue um, where we left off and talk about two more prominent media theories, uses and gratification and muted group theory. Again, one of my faves. So let's go. First, uses and gratification theory. This is a theory that attempts to explain the decision-making processes of media users and consumers. It suggests that there is, in fact, a logic to the choices that we make when it comes to the media that we ultimately select or use, and that the media that we use fulfills a particular desire or a need. In other words, it gratifies us to some extent. Now, there's a few other key points to this theory. First, it suggests that all media competes for your time. So media competes against each other, right? Imagine like an Instagram versus TikTok. They both want you to spend time on their sites. But they also compete for your life. Have you ever stopped to consider how many minutes a day you might spend engaged with various media or even on one particular app? Now, I know that iPhones and Androids have capabilities where they can show you that. Take a big gulp and uh, check it out if you want or not, if you choose not to. But think about it, for example, maybe live streaming or a particular video game on Spotify. What percentage of your day would you say that you spend with those very various mediums? So let's think about um, an application, right, for this theory. And we can do so with that age-old argument that video games make kids prone to violence. Maybe you've heard it phrased in other ways, but I think you probably know what I mean. Going back to the defining characteristics of this theory, we could then argue that no, Video games themselves don't make kids or people violent. Um, they don't make people anything, but rather that people use violent video games in order to gratify a particular need or desire. Now, that sounds worse than it is, but it doesn't have to be. It could simply be that one has a curiosity about violence, um, is looking for an avenue to get out their aggressions or maybe even stress, or to experience something in a game-like form that could never be actualized in real life. Because if you're playing Street Fighter, you can't just rip out someone's spine. That's a reality. So next, here are a variety of some other uses and gratifications claimed in the theory. And one of the best ways that we can understand these features are to phrase them like this. People use said media in order to fill in the gratification. Okay, so we could say people use their phones to play games in order to pass time. Like, for example, if you're waiting for a dentist appointment or if you're in line somewhere. We could also say people watch sports on television, whether or not you're a fan, simply to gratify their need for companionship with others. Think about it. You've met a sports fan before, and they all love to talk about their favorite teams with one another for hours on end. Perhaps you remember last year's beer commercial. I don't remember what beer it was, maybe Heineken or something. And it showed two guys in a bar that didn't even know each other and they were hugging and jumping. Maybe, okay, if not, don't worry about it. Anyway, in the same way um, that we could also say for those of you who really love particular shows or series, that when you find someone who watches the same series or show as you, it feels like you're instantly connected or good friends. So I would ask then, do you like Game of Thrones? Are you watching Westworld? Okay, maybe I'm late to the game on that. Um, I love, I love 
The Marvelous Miss Maisel. Well, if you like any of those, we are now best friends. Best friends. Other uses and gratifications are listed here, including those of adrenaline fans. Now, I have never in my life understood why anyone would pay money or sit down to watch a scary movie, a horror film, if I may. But according to this theory, there is a logic to that decision making. And that is so that you can gratify a particular need for excitement or maybe even escape. Okay, here's some other ones. Uh, maybe a little more taboo, but I like to go over them as well. What about our need to explore taboo or off-limits subjects? Let me explain. Have you ever found yourself or maybe someone you know, right? Let's put it on a third person. Laughing at stand-up comedy that you knew was inappropriate in whatever context. Well, if you have or you know someone who has, you're not a completely terrible human. There is a logic to that decision-making and that laughter, one that also humor scholars have identified as well. When we laugh, there are, even in moments when we shouldn't, if you see someone get hit with a dodgeball, right? Horrible. We experience something called the cognitive relief. In fact, the laughter that you expel, that air through your mouth, tells your brain to go ahead and experience that relief from a built-up tension around that subject. We are both grateful, for example, in the dodgeball uh, situation, that we were not the ones hit by the dodgeball. Also, laughing in that moment allows us, so to speak, a guilt-free, as non-participant, opportunity to relieve some of the social tensions that are also around that taboo or even a mundane subject. And there's other examples here as well. The pornography industry, as we know, is alive and well due to social desires, um, individuals' desires, to obtain an outlet for sexual expression, again, according to this theory. And another one that I like to mention is about how we use the media to gratify our desire to experience something beautiful. Um, I've always said this is kind of why people love watching the Planet Earth series. Like, okay, I'm definitely not going in that cave, but I really want to see what's in there. Side note, can you hear my chickens? Because they are completely distracting. Okay, still moving on. You can extend this theory a little further by asking yourselves a few of these questions. When it comes to media, where do you go just to be amused? Maybe YouTube? To see villains in action? Movies? To experience the ugly side of human nature? To gain perspective about your own life? Maybe a documentary? Or even to reinforce your own political, cultural, environmental, or spiritual beliefs? What would you say? That then brings us to our fourth and final series in this digital lesson. This one is called Muted Group Theory. And while it's not a traditional media theory, it lends itself very nicely to the media world. Now, the theory suggests that within any society, there are groups, non-dominant groups, who are simply not represented equally. And therefore, they are rendered inarticulate or they're ultimately muted by the dominant groups or the media. This is a theory that really has to do with power hierarchies and status quos and as we come to expose them we then learn about who is and who is not allowed to speak in society. Now this week under additional resources you will see a fantastic and short um, mini clip about uncontacted tribes. As you watch the clip, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. How does this particular clip lend itself to muted group theory? In other words, in what way is it an example? Who is muted in this clip and by whom? Who makes decisions on behalf of certain groups? Who has rights? 
and rights according to which society, or decision-making power. Perhaps you can think of other examples of your own. And here's a few to get you started. Muted group theory would set us up to ask important questions like these. For example, does your local news team look like the communities that they report on or serve? What voice do dreamers have in passing immigration legislation? Now, pause for a minute. This is not a matter of should or shouldn't. It is an application of the theory that asks us which group maintains power and voice. A third one, who traditionally speaks and or legislates on behalf of women's reproductive rights? And finally, who develops, let's say, architecturally speaking, homeless shelters? Now, I want to pause there because I have a really great example. I have a dear friend of mine who teaches at a university in Southern California, and he does most of his research um, within and working alongside the homeless population. What he came to find was that the shelters in his nearby community were not filled, and oftentimes many of the beds and resources went unused. So he went to the homeless shelter directors and said, why do you think that these beds and resources are empty and unused. What can we do in order to make them available to the homeless community? Well, the directors said that they were doing all they could. They weren't exactly sure. Maybe they could do some more advertising or promoting insofar as getting the word out. Maybe that it was a transportation issues and they began to brainstorm a lot of ideas. But my friend asked an important question. Who designed these shelters, he said. Well, the commercial real estate company or the builders or the architects that we hired, they replied. Hmm. So my friend then asked, don't you think it would be a good idea to ask the homeless individuals how they want their own shelter to look? Maybe they could have a voice in the design, the architecture, the aesthetics. Well, that changed the look and the feel and the population of the shelters in his community for the next following many years as they brought in individuals without homes and asked them to redesign and redevelop their existing structures. Again, just an example of muted group theory in practice. I hope that these digital videos have brought more understanding to these theories. And again, there are many, many more that we could explore, some of which you will have access to in the readings for this week. Have a good one.